Apple's M2 MacBook Air has been out for over a week now, and while it's a great machine, it's no doubt been causing a lot of controversy and drama in terms of the issues that it has, like the SSD setup and the thermal throttling, and whether those are a big deal, and why Apple would make those decisions. Well, we decided to ask Mark German, who is the number one Apple leaker out there, for his thoughts on all of the drama, who is right, who is wrong, and some other details about future MacBook Pros like the M2 Pro and Max and whether you should wait for those or not, and other details as well. So let's jump right into our interview. Mark German, it is a pleasure to have you on. You reached out on Twitter, we spoke a little bit on Twitter, and you mentioned if you could come on the show, and I'm like, heck yes, if you wanna come on the show, for sure, because as everybody knows, you are the most reliable Apple leaker. You're basically famous in the Apple tech space. So, uh, how's it going? Good. I felt like we had to talk. We had a lot to talk about, given the uh, SSD stuff, the MacBook Air, uh, the MacBook Pros, everything uh, going on lately. It uh, seems like there's a little bit of controversy around some topics, benchmarks, yep. and stuff right now. And uh, I figured it'd be fun to talk about a little bit of a reprieve for my day. So. Yeah, good to talk and uh, congrats awesome. to you guys on. Uh, I saw you have a million subs now as of this week. Almost, so, uh, almost, Hopefully, yeah, so, almost. Uh, be there. Maybe, maybe this video will put you over the top. Who knows? Um, hey, so yeah. let's do it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so let's talk about that drama. But I before I get into the, like the M2 MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, also talking about the future M2 Pro, M2 Max, 14 inch, 16 inch, other Mac products that we're expecting and like three nanometer versus five nanometer for those chips. I do want to start off just real cool with a couple of questions of your background. And the main question I want to ask is, how did you start and in get into Apple leaks? I mean, like everybody wants to know that, you know, how did you become so good at Apple leaks and so reliable? So no, no, I appreciate it. So I started covering Apple around 2010 right when the first iPad came out, I worked wow. for 9 to 5 Mac, was always wow. super interested in uh, Apple products and uh, everything going on with the company, followed it very closely, read all the sites, 9 to 5, Mac rumors, et cetera, that you know, are still around today. There was actually some back then that are no longer around, uh, unfortunately. Wow. Um, so played in that space for a while, worked at 9 to 5 Mac uh, with the crew there for I think six or seven years. Um, mm -hmm. that, that was great. And then I started at Bloomberg in 2016, um, covering mm -hmm. consumer tech in Apple. So Apple, but also my purview is a little broader than that. So I'll cover some of the, the consumer side of Amazon, Samsung, uh, Facebook, I guess we call them meta now mm -hmm. and a few of the other interesting companies. So I have, you know, a lot of flexibility with that, uh, everything going on with Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg podcast and quick take and i have my power on column every weekend and such which yep. anyone should subscribe to bloomberg.com slash uh yeah, power we love on. That. yeah so you know it's been a good time um i love reporting on what's next to come what's the next big thing from apple but also not only the next big thing the next small things as well i like keeping people uh updated on you know what's happening and in our favorite company. Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, Apple, in terms of the attention it gets, is it's no different than the news maybe coming out of a huge entity like, you know, Washington, D.C. or the, the White House and such, right? I mean, everyone is interested in what's the next iPhone going to look like? What's the next iPad going to have? What will the next Apple Watch be able to do? What's the new oh, yeah. iCloud? that's going to be coming out right what, what's new with the mm -hmm. airpods max and whatnot so yeah uh, i think the interest level there is as high as ever and it's uh pretty fun to you know contribute to the community and have discussions with people meet new folks and such and talk to people like you and try to figure out what's next uh for apple yeah <clears throat> and i love doing that i love speculating because like i'm not a leaker i mostly just speculate i look at all the data i try to figure things out um, but you have sources you know yeah, let's go ahead and jump right into the drama. What are your thoughts on it? Is it worth talking about the drama? Like, should Apple be held accountable uh, before we actually get into some of the details? Like, what are your thoughts on the drama? I mean, if you're referring to sort of the SSD thing that I think you were first to cover uh, regarding, mm -hmm. um, so basically, if I have this right, the entry level capacity SSDs on the new MacBook Pro, MacBook Air with M2, 
they have one SSD chip versus two split, which mm -hmm. slows down some file transfers and other things having to do with the SSD. And as yep. you've shown in some of your videos and others have shown, that could have an impact on real world uh, performance for some people yep. in some cases. Now, your first question was, should Apple be held uh, accountable? Should this yeah. information be published out there and how should people respond to it? I think, of course, Apple should be held accountable. I think, of course, these things should be discussed. And I think, of course, that information should be out there. And I think what you should be proud of and what others should be recognizing is if it wasn't for people like you in your channel and other people who discover these things, consumers wouldn't have that information because Apple didn't disclose those mm -hmm. details. In addition, the review units they provided were the higher capacity review units. Now, yep. I don't think that Apple gave higher capacity review units out uh, in order to sort of hide that by any means. Mm -hmm. I don't think Apple was doing anything disingenuous with that. Uh, based on my experience, Apple traditionally does give out the highest capacity, whatever mm -hmm. color you want, the top config in most cases uh, for review units, and they's, they've also done that. So I don't think Apple was mm -hmm. hiding anything. Um, I would say that Apple probably should have put some disclosure uh, on the online store page, or they should have put some sort of bullet point in the legal print at the very bottom of the MacBook Air, MacBook Pro page, uh, saying that you might get even faster performance if you mm -hmm. pick you know, a 512 and up configuration. Obviously, they're not going to say if you pick the 256, it's going to be slower. They would say, and I think that's right and fair, if you pick this configuration and up, you will get faster performance, just like they disclose on the tech specs page for the iPad Pro M1, that if you mm -hmm. get the higher capacity iPad Pros, you will be getting, I believe it's eight gigabytes of RAM instead of six, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there was sort of a fair way to put that in the copy on the website. I don't think it's something that should have necessarily been mentioned at the event. Um, my pet peeve <clears throat> are with the people who say that this doesn't matter and mm -hmm. Apple shouldn't have disclosed anything. Uh, I think that consumers, when they're purchasing these machines, they should have as much detail uh, as possible, right, in order to make their purchasing decisions. Um, obviously, these, you know, are low end on the Mac spectrum, but, you know, $1,200 to $1,800 mm -hmm. or north of that uh, for a machine that you might be holding on to for three or four years. I think these are important purchasing decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. A family member of mine did purchase a new MacBook Air um, uh, when it came out last week, and mm -hmm. I purchased them to get the higher configuration model after I seeing see. um, you know, a lot of the discussion about the base model. It's just mm -hmm. for, you know, when you're already spending a thousand plus, I think a $200, $300 difference is not much more to pay uh, mm -hmm. if you're gonna hold on to that machine for a while. So I think consumers having that information at hand, I think is important. And I, like you guys, I always strive to put as much information out there because consumers mm -hmm. are smart and they're knowledgeable people. People they they want as much information as possible to influence their purchasing decisions and know what they should be doing with their hard-earned cash. Uh, so that's that. I think there's a lot of people who've been pushing back uh, on Geekbench and benchmarking software as well recently. Mm -hmm. My take on that, what you sometimes see, is you see if the if the benchmarks show Apple in a positive light, you should yeah. definitely try. <laughs> <laughs> if they show Apple in a negative light, oh, no, 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 these benchmarks are are crap. They, they, they are not to be trusted, right? So I think what's yeah. important is the information gets you put out there and people can make whatever decisions they want. Um, taking a public stance in either direction, probably not the best approach. Just put the info out and let people make those uh, decisions. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, one point that Luke Miani, I don't know if you watched any of his videos, um, he uh, put out recently on the Genius Bar podcast was that like for YouTube, for example, you know, most of the regular consumers, they just go to the Apple store, they buy whatever they see, you know, but like the small portion that actually care, they're the ones that go research. And that's when like for them, it really matters to know these issues, you know, and I would, I would really hate for somebody to go out by the base model and then they're doing multitasking and they're wondering like, hey, why does it seem slow? Why am I getting laggy? you know, web browsing or whatever. So that's a very good point on the SSD. And I agree that Apple like should have disclosed something, you know, that, you know, the SSD can impact performance because in the past, like we, we would never see a difference where you spend two to $400 on SSD and RAM and you could like literally double the performance of a test just like that. So 
it's very interesting. But there are some more issues I want to ask you about in like how big well, I will say though, like, mm -hmm. I don't think yep. it's a mass real world issue for 90% mm -hmm. of people. I just mm -hmm. think that that data should be out there for that 10% where it may have an impact. And perhaps mm -hmm. Apple realized that most people won't be impacted, uh, so they didn't say anything, right? But that doesn't mean that that information isn't valuable. Thank you. That's a very good point. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about was the whole thermal throttling situation with the MacBook Air. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've uh, I've been using this unit um, considerably. I spend a good amount of time with it just so you know I'm familiar with whatever the latest and greatest was. I think it's awesome. It's, mm -hmm. I miss the tapered edges a lot. I think it's super thin mm -hmm. though and really nice to hold. It feels like I'm on a 16 inch uh, M1 Max MacBook Pro. This feels like a shrunken down version of that. When Apple yeah. does the 15 inch MacBook Air in this form factor next year, I think that's gonna be a really nice machine. I don't know, you know, about the fan situation on that. I do think, mm -hmm. you know, they call it active cooling. It's a fan, fine, doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think it's important um, for people to know that this thing can slow down depending on what you're doing, you know, after a matter of several minutes, whereas you yeah. don't necessarily get that impact on these MacBook Pros. Uh, I have not had a slowdown fans going off sluggishness once that I could actively mm -hmm. feel overheating on this machine. Uh, that's probably not the case for a lot of tasks on the MacBook Air. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it's definitely something consumers should be aware of. If you're a student, you're doing light web browsing, word work mm -hmm. and whatnot, I think you're going to be fine on the MacBook yeah, Air, which is a case. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of Apple saying that this machine doesn't have a fan, you might have these slowdown issues. They go in the opposite direction, which is MacBook Pro has this active cooling system yeah, that has the true. same performance. Now, if I put myself in the shoes of Apple's marketers, of course, that's what I'm going to do. Of course, that's yep. what you would do. That's what any you know knowledgeable person with you know any business background is going to do. Yep. So you know, I'm not faulting Apple on that uh, at all. But mm -hmm. it is important for consumers to you know recognize the differences. And you know, I don't know. You know, someone should make a chart about what the penetration of Apple stores and Best Buys and stores where you can play with these machines in person are in the United mm -hmm. States and globally, right? I wonder what percentage of the U.S. population is within 10 miles from an Apple store or Best Buy where you can try these out. But I do mm -hmm. think it's a good thing that Apple has 250 stores or actually it's I think it's 270 or 71 stores in the U.S. at this point, probably hundreds of more Best Buys where you can maybe play with your workflow a little bit to see if that machine is a fit for you. Uh, for me personally, based on my usage of it, it's not for me. And I don't think mm -hmm. it's for, you know, most, or I'll take that back. Maybe it's for most people, but this way, it's not for most people that I know and work with, mm -hmm. right? Like I think it's a fit for your, you know, video editing rig and, you know, everything that you might be doing and, you know, others mm -hmm. in the space might be doing, uh, for me, it's not a fit with my thousand Chrome tabs. I'm exaggerating, uh, open <laughs> at once but for my family member who is using the machine right? Mm -hmm. Which I think maybe in this case is probably representative of most people. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's a perfect. No, that's a very good point. Yeah. I think for like light usage, a lot of web browsing, a little bit of light productivity, I think it's also a great machine, especially the new, um, the new design. But one thing that I noticed, I don't know if you watched the teardowns of this MacBook Air or not. Did you by any chance? Uh, I, have not, well, I did not watch the teardown videos uh, uh -huh. of the MacBook Air. If you're talking about the iFixit one. But I read some summaries and saw some photos and such of uh, the insides uh, of the new. Yeah, one thing that's very interesting is that uh, people actually compared the cooling solution that came on the M1 MacBook Air to this new M2. And the interesting part is that they actually had like a block heat sink on the M1. And on this M2, they just have like this thin metal shielding without like a actual proper heat sink. So um, like that's kind of like disappointing, at least in my perspective, because if you watch the teardown, there's like this entire section on the left side, which is like almost empty. And it's like, why didn't they use up that space? Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on like the heat sink situation. I would guess that they thought the M2 could be a bit more efficient than the M1 and maybe not mm -hmm. generate much heat in terms of the heat sink and the changes there. My guess mm -hmm. uh, would be that that contributes to making the machine lighter and potentially thinner, being able mm -hmm. to, you know, make that change in the engineering there. 
And I think the goal for this product was in order to, you know, thin it down a little bit, right? Get it a little bit lighter. I think they shaved off a couple uh, tenths of a pound. And I think um, it is slightly thinner overall when you don't factor in the tapers of the previous mm -hmm. model. For that product, I think they just wanted to go as thin as light, uh, thin and light as possible. Um, mm -hmm. What I think they ultimately probably should do is they may want to come out with a cheaper configuration of the 14 inch MacBook Pro and get rid mm -hmm. of that 14 inch MacBook Pro in the middle with the touch bar and that old design. Um, mm -hmm. I think that a 14 inch MacBook Pro at maybe the 1499 or 1599 price point uh, that sits yeah. between the Air and the MacBook Pro, uh, I think that would do pretty well and that would be a pretty good machine for a lot of people. You mm -hmm. keep that at that M2 chip rather than the M2 Pro, M2 Max. You put the fan in there and you have that new design. Mm -hmm. You charge $100 more for it. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that would be an excellent direction. And then you have sort of the 15 inch uh, MacBook Air below that. My, mm -hmm. I do hope for the 15 inch product that they do have sort of a more M1 like heatsink and maybe some sort of active cooling solution, uh, oh, yeah. especially if the rumors are true that there'll be an M2 Pro version of the 15 inch MacBook Air. And mm -hmm. all things equal, I don't believe that. I, I don't see how they can put an M2 Pro uh, inside a 15 inch MacBook Air unless there mm -hmm. are some changes improvements to the uh, internals in order to provide better sustained performance and less issues related to heat. Nice. And do you think that lower end 14 inch uh, might come as soon as the M3 model? Like when do you think that could possibly come like the replacement for the 13 inch MacBook Pro? Yeah, to be clear, I haven't heard anything about this uh, 14 inch MacBook uh -huh. Pro being in the works. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that I, I just was speculating off the cuff of, you know, what they should mm -hmm. do to sort of solve this issue. Uh, and that mm -hmm. gap there, uh, I have not heard uh, of that specifically. Uh, what I have heard is that there will be new, this is no shock to anyone, there will be new 14 inch and 16 inch high end MacBook Pros. Uh, mm -hmm. Given the lockdown situation, the chip shortage, and all the other uh, circumstances that Apple's dealing with right now, I don't have an exact launch. Their plan is and has been to launch them this fall around October, November. Mm -hmm. Same designs, but they would have the M2 Pro, M2 Max chips in both the 14 inch and 16 inch units. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sort of giving a window of between uh, late fall and spring in order to mm -hmm. sort of factor in possible supply chain issues. Uh, but those machines are uh, engineering wise, those are basically done. So those will hit the 15 inch MacBook Air uh, with the current 13 inch design, but bigger. That's supposed mm -hmm. to come between spring and summer of 2023. So next year, okay. that's the M2 line still. Okay. Uh, and then in, you know, keeping it moving in terms of future MacBooks, there's also mm -hmm. a new 12 inch uh, MacBook in the works. I personally oh, there is. That, right, I, I've written about that yes. in the past. I do think mm -hmm. that will be a 12 inch MacBook Pro sort of to harken back to the 12 inch power book they had from a long time ago. Uh, that probably not gonna come before 2024 and that's mm -hmm. likely to be uh, an M3 lineup. The M2 yep. chip is basically a stopgap chip. Um, yes. If you think about how long, <laughs> well, so. have you said that? if you've said that too, that is accurate. The whole idea yep. of the M2 mm -hmm. is that it's a stopgap chip. What I think people don't know is that the underlying architecture of the M1 and is a year behind the mm -hmm. underlying architecture of the A-series chips, and the M2 mm -hmm. is a year behind as well. And so they're going to need to catch up at some point to bring mm -hmm. uh, the A-series and the M-series to the same underlying architecture. And so mm -hmm. the M1 is based on A14, the M2 is based on the uh, A15, uh, yep. the M3 is based on the A16. So these M2 chips we have today that's based on the same architecture as what you have in the iPhone 13, right? Mm -hmm. And so the M3 will be the same architecture you're getting with the A16 uh, for the iPhone 13 Pros this year. And so perhaps mm -hmm. 20, end of 2023, when you start seeing those same M3 chips, right? You know, then that's when you're really gonna be catching up with the iPhone 14. And then maybe at some point they change the underlying architecture, maybe with the M4 and get exactly in the same uh, line mm -hmm. there as the A-series chips. So a lot to be done there. But yeah, if you think about how long the M1 lasted as a chip, the first M1 machines came out November 2020. Uh, November 2020. You're still going to see M1 machines or Macs with the M1. So 
the newest Mac at a particular product line with an M1 mm -hmm. being in that place into 2023. So the M1 mm -hmm. is going to last a long time, whereas I think the M2 is going to have a much shorter lifespan as uh, the new okay. chip uh, in a particular unit. For instance, the iMac. The iMac is skipping M2 altogether, and that's okay. going to be so it is. Nice. next year. Yeah, whereas the yeah. M2, obviously, you'll see M2 variations of the MacBook Pro and sort of their higher volume machines. The iMac, for mm -hmm. all intents and purposes, is no longer a super high volume uh, product. Now, I have some thoughts on what you said about the whole um, A16 chip and everything. I kind of had some speculation of um, because the the iPhone chips, the A, the A series chips, come every single year, but it seems like the M chips are more on like a 18 month kind of cycle. Eventually, they're going to have to skip something, right? So my thought is, what if, I don't know about your thoughts on this, but what if um, the M2 Pro and the M2 Max, as well as the M3, they skip straight to 3 nanometer, which is going to match the A17, in my opinion, which the A17 will also be 3 nanometer. What do you think about that? Or do you think maybe 3 nanometer could come sooner? Or what are your thoughts? Because a lot of people say it's going to be 5 nanometer for sure for the M2 Pro, M2 Max, but I disagree. Yeah, I don't see, given everything going on with TSMC, right, and they're a little mm -hmm. behind Samsung and some of the other fabs when it comes to 3 nanometer tech, um, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily see how they would be able to get 3 nanometer in um, the Max this year. I think that's probably a next year thing. The iPhone mm -hmm. 14 Pro and Pro Max, as we know, those are going to be 5, what do they call it, 5 Plus, right, or some variation, some yeah. sort of upgraded N5P, version. Of I think. Something like that. Yeah, an upgraded variation yeah. of 5 nanometer. Um, mm -hmm. What's also fascinating to me is that for the first time since Apple started making its own chips for the phone, um, mm -hmm. the base iPhone 14 and the iPhone 14 Max, the non-pros, those are mm -hmm. not going to get the A16. Those are going to be stuck on the A15, right? And yeah. I believe that's going to be a long-term differentiation between the pros and non-pros on the phones. Just like on the Mac, you're having regular M2, regular M3, et cetera, versus Pro and Pro Max uh, variations yeah. of those chips. So, you know, I think that's going to be fascinating. What do you think about the MacBook Air? Because right now we still have the M1 MacBook Air for 1,000, and we have the M2 MacBook Air for 1,200. Do you think it's possible that when the M3 comes out, what if they take the M2 chip and also, like, keep the M2 as the baseline either in the old design or I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think that they, as new generations come out, they will retain the previous generation and bring that down in price. So once the M3 mm -hmm. MacBook Airs come out, and that's probably two years away, um, I would say, yeah, of course, it's two years away from now, maybe a year and a half, but I think closer to two years, if not longer, they mm -hmm. will replace that $1,000 um, M1 MacBook Air with a $1,000 M2 MacBook Air, the one that exists today, right? And okay. the plan, that was mm -hmm. the plan. The plan was always for this M2 MacBook Air to come in at $200 higher than mm -hmm. the MacBook Air M1 and to retain that MacBook Air 1 at that $1,000 price point. So the M2 mm -hmm. today, in two years from now, $200 price drop. Nice. So I wanted to ask about the M2 and M2, uh, M2 Pro and M2 Max 14 and 16 inch. Do you know of any potential features? Any kind of exclusive feature differences you might know, like potentially Face ID, can we expect that? Or do we wait longer? What do you think? So there won't be any Face ID this year. Uh, they've worked They've worked on it. The problem with Face mm -hmm. ID is the thickness uh, of the display. Uh, I think uh -huh. if you see Face ID appear on a Mac, it will appear in the iMac first. Uh, okay. I personally do think that Touch ID is probably uh, the most convenient at this point uh, on a keyboard more convenient than having FaceTime uh, or Face ID in the display, I'm. they would have a user experience problem to figure out how people know they're logging into a computer just with their face. What would you click to get through? Obviously, that's a mm. software and UI problem. It's pretty easy to solve. The hard part is the technical challenge of getting in that thin screen. They should be able mm. to do it technology-wise in a more expensive iMac because of that component cost. I would doubt it would be on the very low end. Um, but I don't anticipate Face ID appearing on a MacBook or anything like that anytime at all in the near future. Oh, wow. That's probably used to be, uh, technology wise. Mm -hmm. And in terms mm -hmm. of the M2 Pro and M2 Max, uh, I don't have the core counts in front of me. Um, but if you look back and see what I've reported, it's going to be that. I think right now it's a 10 core uh, CPU and a mm -hmm. 32 core.
core GPU, right? I believe, and we'll have to double check my stories, I believe they're moving to a 12 core CPU and they're moving to, I think it's a 38 or 40 core GPU. So you're gonna mm -hmm. see uh, increases on both the CPU speeds uh, and the GPU core counts and overall speeds as well. Uh, I think if you're on an M1 Pro or M1 Max machine today, I'm not sure you're gonna wanna necessarily run out and uh, swap out just mm -hmm. for the increased core counts. These are going to be mm -hmm. spec bumps. As we've seen on the iPhone and the iPad, you rarely see a spec bump only on those devices, the more high volume mm -hmm. devices. But I think on the Mac, what we're used to as consumers over the last 20 years plus is that they do refresh the machines annually, right? Or every year yep. and a half, eight months with an upgraded processor without any more fundamental changes to the product. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're going to see uh, with this M2 version. Thank you. Yeah, I actually agree with that. I think they'll most likely just swap out the chip and as far as other changes, probably they won't. Now, I did want to ask you about another Mac. Par yep, with like the transition. It would be on par with the transition from the M1 13-inch Pro to the M2 13-inch Pro, where I think it was okay. you or a few other people, they opened that thing up and it's identical other than the chip swap. Yep. I think someone also tried putting the M1 chip in the yep. M2 Mac Pro. Was that you? Luke, Luke Miani. Him, yeah, and yep. that didn't work. I thought that was interesting. Yep. I'm not surprised it didn't work, but I did think that was funny. Um, yes, but, yeah. yeah, but anyways, <laughs> now I, I did want to ask you about another Mac mini, which I personally, based on Apple's filings of the EEC numbers and different model numbers that we got with the M2 Air and um, whatever else, do you think we could potentially see the redesigned M2 Mac mini this fall? Yeah, I don't think there will be a redesign to the Mac mini. Not I actually really. don't know where the rumors of a redesign came from. I think mm -hmm. those are also going to be spec bumps. If you look at the Mac Studio, the Mac Studio mm -hmm. looks like a double height Mac uh, Mac Mini. And it mm -hmm. would be really weird to just come out with this Mac Studio, and then you have a Mac Mini, the smaller variation of the Mac Studio, um, basically coming in with a new design. That would be odd to me. The Mac Studio is basically a Mac Mini Pro, right? They're just calling mm -hmm. it the Mac yeah. Studio. The Mac Mini, mm -hmm. you'll see an M2 version as well as an M2 Pro version. Because right now you have an M1 version of the Mac Mini. I also mm -hmm. believe they still sell an Intel variation of the Mac Mini. Is that right? Or they used to? I, I think, think you need they do. Right. So you need a replacement mm -hmm. for that performance. And that's why you're going to see the M2 Mac Mini and the M2 Pro Mac Mini. What I had heard was that there are three Mac Minis planned for 2022. The three oh. being the M2 Mac Mini, the M2 Pro Mac Mini, and then the Mac Studio. Okay, so that would mean they would come probably this fall and you'd have the option of the M2 or the M2 Pro in the same Mac Pro. Yeah, they also had an M1 Mac Pro uh, ready to go months ago. Oh, they, they did, but okay. I guess they scrapped that to just wait for the M2 Pro version. Okay, so what are your thoughts? Do you think it's going to come this year, potentially if they release it in December with the whole M2 Pro-based quad ship? Or do you think they're going to wait till next year? Because I believe Ming Shu Kuo thinks it's waiting till next year. What are, are you talking thoughts? about? Mac Mini or the Mac Pro? The Mac Pro. The Mac Pro. Mac Pro. I think that will be announced uh, end of year. They were going to announce okay. it at UWDC, but that didn't happen. I think they're going to announce it end of year and then release it next year in 2023. And then there'll be an iMac Pro at some point as well. That's been in, in active development. Mm -hmm. So that will be sometime next year, maybe the year after. So those both are coming. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to call the chip in the Mac Pro the M2 Extreme. So what okay. that is, is it's the M2 Ultra. So the M1 Ultra, but the M2 variation, right? Mm -hmm. so Mac Pro, just like the M, the Mac Studio, the base is the is the Max, and the high end mm -hmm. is the Ultra. Then mm -hmm. the Mac Pro, the base is the Ultra, and the high end is the 2X Ultra. And mm -hmm. I really don't think there's anything else you can call it other than M2 Extreme. Extreme. Yeah, that's a yes. good name. So you, you think they might announce it this year and maybe January they'll release uh, it? Uh, I don't think it'll be released in January, no. Oh, okay. So their springtime? Probably, if not a little okay. later, maybe summer. Um, oh, wow. Maybe they don't even get announced this year. There is so much on their plate to announce right now and ship mm -hmm. right now. And the problem they're facing is the allocation of resources for both production of the actual hardware and equipment mm -hmm. combined with inflation and pricing and everything going on there. Plus... Uh, circumstances around the chip shortage, right? So needing mm -hmm. to allocate which chips go where, uh, which process nodes they're using for which products, and mm -hmm. where they're allocating the resources. Now, you know, number one priority, the first thing they have to do is make sure they have enough chips for the phones, enough A16 chips for the phones. Remember, yep. this is 
Fab, TSMC doing all of Apple's chips across the product family at this point. And so I don't think anything of significance happens until they have full uh, understanding and full ability to pop out as many A16s as they need. Do you think there's a chance that they can switch from, like in the past they used to design the A series chip and then they'd kind of soup it up to the AX in the iPad Pro. Do you think there's a chance they could switch to do the reverse where they do the highest end, you know, let's say the M2 Max first and then kind of take that and then shrink it down to the A17, for example? What are I don't think that? so. I think from an engineering okay. perspective, it really has to be done the other way because you need mm -hmm. that core architecture in place. And mm -hmm. the M1 chip is the A14 chip from, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that would be the iPhone 12. Right, it's the iPhone 12's A14 chip with additional CPU cores and additional GPU cores, plus mm -hmm. some of the advanced media encoders and, and whatnot, some of the extra bells and whistles you need for a Mac-based processor. Uh, mm -hmm. Also the expanded neural engine uh, as well. Yeah, so uh, what about other products this fall? Like potentially, what do you think about the iPad 10? Do you think it's getting the full USB-C redesign or no? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, the iPad 10, if you're, are you referring to the 10th generation base iPad? Yep, the, the budget, yeah, base iPad. Yeah, and it should look the same as the current one, but have USB-C, uh, as well as the, uh, I believe it's the A14. I don't have my notes in front of me, but it should be the A14 mm -hmm. and USB-C. And so at the end of this year, all new iPads will be USB-C. Next mm -hmm. year, you'll see the USB-C transition uh, continue onto the iPhone. And so the iPhone 15, that line, that will be USB-C. Uh, as well. What about the AirPods Pro 2? I did see a report recently where the AirPods Pro could actually switch to USB-C this year, like before the iPhone 15 switches. Do you think that makes sense or? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I mm -hmm. honestly don't know the answer to that question, but it makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. Given the timeline that the AirPods Pro is on, it seems like it's a two, let's see, I'm trying to remember. It's a three year upgrade cycle, right? So the 2019, yeah. 2019 is when the initial AirPods Pro launched, right? And mm -hmm. so the next ones will come out around three years at the end of 2022. Uh, and so if those are going to be on the marketplace for two to three years, it would make sense uh, to move that to USB-C for this generation. And I think oh, if nice. they do that, yeah, it would be a very strong hint for that to happen on the iPhone next year as well. Um, mm -hmm. I do think three years is too long maybe for that upgrade cycle for the AirPods Pro because you know, Samsung is coming out their new earbuds pros next year. I think that's a one or two year upgrade yeah. cycle. So, you know, maybe Apple should step up, step on the gas uh, a little bit uh, on those. I have the AirPods Max uh, in gray like you have. I think mm -hmm. they look a little ridiculous on me. This is why I'm not wearing them. To be completely <laughs> honest. I think the case is uh, tremendously bad. Uh, mm -hmm. I think those uh, AirPods Max probably need a little bit of an upgrade. I also don't mm -hmm. think they sound as good as their price might, uh, you know, mm -hmm and what some people may think of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely think that they're comfortable and they obviously have oh, yeah. a nice accessible design. So there's definitely utility there. I think the market has shown that people are unwilling to pay the full 550 for them. That's why you've seen so many uh, discounts. Okay. I saw a sky blue pair on bnhphoto.com um, yesterday at four, uh, 439, so 440. Yeah. Right, and I think that four hundred dollar, four fifty price point is probably about the sweet spot for those. So, not entirely sure how Apple landed on the five fifty. Do you think there's a chance with the AirPods Max two or whatever? I don't know when they're coming out, but do you think there's a chance Apple could lower the price point, or they're just going to keep the same? Just your own speculation. Uh, this would just be pure speculation. I would say maybe they'll, you know, knock them down to four ninety nine, throw mm -hmm. some new colors, USB C on them. Um, you tell me, what, what, what do you think is missing from the AirPods Max at this point, feature set-wise? I mean, I think, first of all, uh, lossless audio support because they don't support lossless and, of course, the USB-C. Other than that, they're pretty good. I did want to ask you about the lossless. Do you have any info on that, potentially, for the AirPods Pro 2 or for these Macs and when we could expect it? Uh, I think there will be some lossless-like functionality on the AirPods Pro 2. I'm not mm -hmm. entirely sure. Uh, there are definitely new AirPods Max. Uh, headphones in the works. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know when those are coming at this point. They were supposed to come this year uh, mm -hmm. with new colors. So sort of like a color refresh, just like you get like the band color refreshes on the Apple Watch. So it might be next year, potentially. Um, I think it'll be this year. I think oh, okay. Year. Uh, but I don't know for sure. And uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you, another product, which we've been talking about a little bit, is the Apple Watch. 
Um, cause I know that, you know, there's the whole rugged thing and it's just so confusing with everything that happened. Cause we thought the series seven would be like this new redesign, but it ended up, you know, being a little bit more curvy. So what are your thoughts? Is there a chance that the one that's coming this year, specifically the new, you know, pro model that we might get, that's going to be more expensive. Do you think it's going to be redesigned with like a more flat design or what are your thoughts on that? I will let my power on newsletter this weekend answer that question. So oh, okay. if you uh, tune into that, if the video goes live after that's out, head mm -hmm. to uh, your email if you're not subscribed or boomberg.com or my Twitter. But that is a good Exciting. question. Definitely. Uh, yeah, something that I know a lot of people have been asking me about. That's exciting. What about any of the other features um, that you might think could be coming in terms maybe like the material or anything else? And if it's going to like start at a very high price, um, like, I, like I personally think there like there's a perfect spot for a pro model because like, you know, when people are going to pay more, they want it to say pro in my opinion, you know? Um, I think it'll be called the Apple Watch Pro, and I think it'll be okay. between nine hundred and a thousand dollars. I mm -hmm. think it's going to be a very high-end Apple Watch with more battery life, uh, mm -hmm. with a bigger display, um, with more durability, right? And I think mm -hmm. that is going to—it's uh, not going to be the most popular Apple Watch given the price point, but I think it's something that would certainly be interesting to the consumer that's willing to spend the money on an iPhone 13 Pro Max or a 16-inch mm -hmm. MacBook Pro, right? Mm -hmm. It's for the, uh, the ultimate Apple consumer, I think you can say. And it's interesting that they've really, you know, went full throttle on this standard versus pro uh, strategy where they're delineating some of the products in their lineup. And so, you know, I'm very fascinated to see, uh, you know, how they launch it in September. And uh, final thoughts. Uh, you did break a report recently about Apple, like slowing hiring and uh, slowing spending. Like, do you have any details on that and like what's going on in the whole space? I don't know if you want to talk about potential recessionary stuff or... Sure. I mean, you know, many economists out there, the stock market, uh, the fluctuating U.S. dollar, uh, higher interest rates, obviously rising inflation, the gas price situation that we all know about. You know, clearly there is some sort of economic downturn or recession, recession or recession like event looming. Right. And so Apple and the CFO's office, what they're trying to do is sort of anticipate how they can keep the company in the most good standing as possible through a situation like that. And what does mm -hmm. that mean? That means perhaps not hiring as quickly as they would like to, not spending as much money on human-based capital R&D uh, as they would like to. Perhaps that means not backfilling roles as much as what they would like to uh, in some divisions, right? I don't anticipate that negative, uh, you know, hit and process hitting some of their more, you know, important areas such as future products, whether that's the mixed reality headset, the electric mm -hmm. car. Uh, but I would be shocked if they didn't scale down some hiring and spending on some pretty mature units in the company, like perhaps the iPhone, the iPad, uh, maybe the Apple Watch, right? But I think the hotter areas of growth, AI, cloud, services, car, AR, VR, um, mm -hmm. MR, whatever you want to call it, I think that is going to continue. And do you think any of the products that we're seeing this year, like maybe even the M2 MacBooks and like the future iPhones, do you think those were impacted by like the whole situation, potential recession? Do you think they've changed those already and their plans for those in anticipation of a slowdown to like cut costs, higher profit margins? What do you think on that? I would say that regarding the MacBook, mm -hmm. uh, M2 and the MacBook Air, the impact there from COVID and some of the economic situations we've seen, that had to do with the shipment, the shipping timeframe. So this mm -hmm. MacBook Air launched, I would say, let's see, six to nine months later than it was supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was driven primarily by COVID and allocation of resources. In terms of recessionary stuff, economics, um, I think that factors a little bit into the iPhone 14. Now, the mm -hmm. chip shortage is twofold. The one part of the chip shortage that everyone talks about is it may, being harder to get chips, right? Mm -hmm. That you know, That's very obvious. Part two of the chip shortage is the inflation aspect for it, the cost mm -hmm. aspect for it, freight and shipping. 
in the allocation yep. of resources, right? And so I think a decision had to be made to sort of split the iPhone 14 between A15 models and A16 models versus the basic versus the pro. And I think the chip shortage and combined with the costs that go into being able to get those chips factored in. So I think that the decision was, do we wanna make the base iPhone 14s more expensive and include the A16? Because the mm -hmm. A16 today is more expensive to make than it may have been three years ago because of oh, everything yeah. going on economically plus the chip mm -hmm. short, right? Or do we retain the A15 and keep the price the same? What is gonna do better for sales and what do consumers care more about? And I think they made the correct decision if those were indeed the two decisions to make, I think they made the correct decision whereas the buyer of a base iPhone 14 or I4, iPhone 14 Max, they are more mm -hmm. concerned with how much they pay for it mm -hmm. versus the performance differences between the A15 and the A16, where someone who might be spending more money on an iPhone 14 Pro or iPhone 14 Pro Max, they mm -hmm. are more concerned with the performance of the product and the upgrade on the chip rather than the price pressure. Yeah, thank you. I agree with that. And um, do you think there's going to be a price increase for the Pro models? Uh, I don't know. Perhaps on maybe they'll play around with pricing a little differently on storage capacities. I personally mm -hmm. would be would not be surprised either way if right like the iPhone 14 Max came in at you know 899 right or 999 and they made yep. the the Pro models a little bit more expensive. So I don't know the answer to that question, uh, but I think what we've seen from Apple, given the products they've already launched in 2022, I don't think we've seen. Um, price increases or price changes that are out of scope from what had already been planned uh, okay. for the inflationary pressures we're seeing, right? I think Apple realizes it would be a mistake to start hiking prices on top of everything else going on. Yeah, because if they hike prices and then people are more like, you know, thinking about budget, it could not lead to lower sales. Uh, what do you think about like the base storage of the iPhone? Do you think it's gonna stick around to 128 for another year or maybe like the iPad Pro? When do you think those will go to 256? Oof, probably not for a little while, especially okay. given the chip shortage and everything else uh, going on and the freight costs that might go into shipping chips and making mm -hmm. a ship like that. Uh, yeah, I would say they're gonna stick to 128 on the base, um, at least for the non-pros, right? Um, it's funny. So I have the 256 gigabyte and I was thinking about like which storage capacity I would get uh, mm -hmm. for for this year. I think I maybe get the maybe we'll get the 512. The mm -hmm. interesting thing to me is that, you know, an important thing to me is the value that these devices hold and being able to resell them. Mm -hmm. So if you have a 256 gigabyte iPhone, if you have a one terabyte iPhone, um, they have a one terabyte iPhone, right? think they do i think so right um those are worth the same on the marketplace mm -hmm. right if you're going to resell them to your carrier or to apple and you know ebay and such right the storage doesn't have a big factor there so i think you can offload some things to the cloud and make it work and such so i try to go with the lower storage capacity that i can get away with awesome well thanks for answering those questions i just want to know like do you plan to work at bloomberg for i don't know if you can answer that or not you know for longer like stay in the apple space leaking apple stuff for long term yeah i think i'll be in the apple space uh, for the foreseeable future obviously the future is long and you know i have a lot of you know plans for the future and such um but you know as of right now i don't see myself going anywhere uh anytime soon i think it's definitely uh exciting to to cover apple and to write about products and have conversations like this um so yeah i couldn't be happier to do it uh, obviously, you know, when you do something for so long, so at this point, I've been in this space for 12 years or so, mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it could feel like it's getting long in the tooth or it could feel like, you know, maybe I should try something different. But what I've been able to do is sort of expand to, you know, talking about other companies from time to time, uh, whether it's like I mentioned Amazon and whatnot. Um, also, as Apple increases its areas of interest, there are thereby creates new areas of interest for me, AR, VR, car, mm -hmm. AI, et cetera. Uh, and the other thing is being able to tell interesting stories in new ways, such as being able to go on Bloomberg TV, uh, mm -hmm. being able to hop on podcasts, being able to hop on shows like yourself. Um, my power on column as well has been a big, you know, energy boost for me too. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely think that, you know, yeah, this should continue for, you know, the foreseeable future. You think I should continue? I definitely think so, man. Like, you give us a lot, a lot of awesome leaks, awesome sources. 
and that obviously provides us with like content to make and also like stuff to speculate on and i mean you're like the king of chip leaks with all the core counts it's like i don't even know how you get that but it's right like all the time put it this way i'm happy to give you and your channel and a few other channels you know things to talk about uh there are a few channels and a few people on twitter that i'm not so you know happy to give material for them to talk about and monetize and such but you know i guess it's the nature of the beast hey man well i appreciate it it's been an honor having you on you know we don't do this kind of stuff no podcast stuff but for you you know we'll make an exception and it's been awesome to have you i really appreciate it uh any final thoughts or if you want to make a shout out for people uh yeah if you haven't checked out the newsletter it's uh, bloomberg.com slash power on uh, I'm on Twitter at, at Mark Gurman. Uh, should have some more exciting scoops and stories out in the coming days. And, you know, I guess hopefully for the foreseeable future, like I said. So please stay uh, tuned for that. And congrats to you and your channel, you guys, on the uh, all the success so far. And hope Thank to you. do this again soon. Awesome. Thank you, Mark Gurman. Thank you, sir.